This is a story, a 1927 mystery story, really. It's not told by the principal character, but by family members, townspeople, contemporaneous newspaper accounts, historical records, and theories. Theories about how Sandwich native Eugene Windsor Haynes disappeared and was ultimately declared dead. It's a story of a man of character and principles, loved by his family, admired by his town. A man who lived and earned a simple, honest life by the sea in a small Cape town and was selected for esteemed positions in local, county, and state government. But ultimately, his death is not a peaceful one passing away comfortably with his beloved family at his bedside? No, although we'll come to see that this is an ending that certainly would have been well deserved from the life led by Eugene Haynes. But no, rather his disappearance and death in 1927 was surrounded by mystery and to many still is will follow his life, disappearance, and death. And in the end, each of us will have our own theories. It has to be that way. It remains to this day an enduring mystery. However, for me, what has been far more important is Eugene's life and legacy. And so this story as well will reflect on his time spent living living in Sandwich with his family and many friends. Throughout this presentation, you're going to find that we talk a lot about Sandwich, and that's fitting, as Eugene's life was solidly rooted in his hometown. So, who was this man who left his Main Street home in the early hours of November 19, 1927, to pull his lobster traps and was never seen again, whose disappearance caused every able-bodied sandwich man to scour the beaches from Sandwich to Provincetown and activated the United States Coast Guard in boats and seaplanes to search for him. Records show that Eugene W. Haynes was born in Sandwich on December 13, 1865, to George Lyman Haynes and Sarah Nye Marstons. At the time of Eugene's birth, his father George was 23 and his mother Sarah was 20. Eugene was the first of three children, all boys. Frank Abbott Haynes, born in 1870, and George Homer Haynes, born in 1874. The Boston and Sandwich Glass Factory was still in operation when Eugene was born. Indeed, census records show that his father George worked in the factory in a few capacities as a clerk, glassmaker, and glass cutter. Much against his father's wishes, George joined the 45th Regiment, Company D, in 1862, shortly after the Civil War began, 
and saw action in Kinston, North Carolina. Fortunately, George was not injured and was mustered out in 1863, and shortly thereafter, married Sarah Nye Marstons, Eugene's mother. Eugene Haynes's father, George, was very active in town. At various times throughout his life in Sandwich, in addition to his earlier work in the glass factory, George was also a constable, town auditor, and assistant postmaster. So, the lifestyle Eugene was born into was one of service, and he followed in his father's footsteps in his dedication to the many positions he held in the town of Sandwich and beyond. Eugene held local elected offices and state appointed positions. He was respected Cape wide as a businessman and a man of character. And as we shall see, much beloved by the Sandwich townspeople. What I found remarkable is that there are abundant newspaper accounts of Eugene Haynes, which proved invaluable in piecing together his life and the mystery surrounding his disappearance. We'll start following the life of Eugene W. Haynes as a young man. The first account I could find of young Eugene is in 1875. At the tender age of 10, the Yarmouth Register relates that he met with an accident while fooling with a playmate by which he had one of the bones in his leg crack. At age 14, he and a group of other East Sandwich youths formed a temperance society. He and Willie Foster were elected vice presidents. In a certain sense, it's not surprising that he and Willie Foster would be organizers of a temperance society, even considering their young ages. Both the Haynes and Foster families live next door to each other on Spring Hill, East Sandwich. And most certainly, Eugene and Willie were friends. Members of the Foster family were for generations committed Quakers and abolitionists. And as such, this would have had a strong influence on Willie Foster. And apparently, it seems, Eugene for a boy of 14 to be engaged in forming a temperance society is an interesting and significant commitment. We'll see that his apparent conviction to the mission of the temperance society, a countrywide social movement against the consumption of alcoholic beverages, may have shaped his actions as a town constable later on in his life. We follow numerous newspaper accounts attesting to Haynes's athletic skills as a young man growing up in Sandwich. One story tells us about the Sandwich Athletics team, which was formed in 1885. Eugene was chosen captain and Ezra T. Pope Jr. secretary and treasurer. The Sandwich Observer mentions that the team will obtain uniforms at once and during the current season hope to make a good showing. The game played in June 1885 against the Sandwiches was a bit lopsided, with the Athletics losing 14-2. However, Eugene, playing first base, made a good showing with five at bats, two base hits, 12 putouts, and no errors. Here we see a picture of him in 1888 in the Sandwich Observer with his baseball team, the Sandwich Athletics. That year they won the Southeastern Massachusetts Championship. At this time, Eugene also played what was called polo. From the newspaper accounts, it seems this polo was similar to our current day ice hockey, 
with one major exception. It was not played on ice. Rather, they played with roller skates on wooden floors. The games were held in the casino building on School Street. The Sandwich Observer reports that a large number were assembled to witness the game on February 23rd, 1885. There were six members on each team, and from the published account, it was a rough and tumble game. The rule was that no one who had ever played before could be on a team. And by the end of the game, which was reported as more force than science, both sides had black eyes and swollen heads. The news article also observed, there was some high and lofty tumbling, but we think Donovan rather excelled in the spread eagle act. On June 18th, a team was played from the town of Carver. And something you wouldn't see today, the game was stopped early to allow the visitors to scurry down the railroad station on Java Street to catch the last train back to Carver. He was very active in the Republican Party, the original party of Abraham Lincoln. And at various times throughout the years, Eugene was elected representative to the Republican caucus and served dutifully on the Sandwich Republican Committee. We find him entering into the insurance business at the age of 29 in 1894 as a fire insurance agent. Here's an advertisement he placed in the Sandwich Observer. And soon after, he formed a co-partnership with Sandwich native Ambrose E. Pratt, conducting a life accident and fire insurance business with an office in the novelty block on Java Street. And as was a consistent thread really throughout his life, he was successful in this field as he rose to be elected among his peers at the age of 35 as a director of the Barnstable County Mutual Fire Insurance Company. Eugene was a member of this company and an elected director for the remainder of his life. However, it seems he was ever ready to start up other businesses. This was decidedly shown when beginning in 1892, he began selling shoes from an office in the Novelty Block on Java Street. And in 1904, a Barnstable Patriot article reads that Eugene Haynes announces the opening of his ice cream saloon and restaurant for the season in the Burbank building on Main Street. On June 27, 1899, Eugene marries Mary Frances Lovell. Eugene was 34 and Mary, a sandwich native and daughter of Benjamin Lovell, and Francis Fish was 22. Here we have a picture of them some years later in 1917. Eugene was a very social and musically talented person. He was a member of the Sandwich Brass Band and Orchestral Band playing the brass drum as well as the alto. In fact, his wife Mary, or Mamie as she was called, also played the piano at many functions and gatherings. They both appeared in many town plays and productions throughout the years and sang in the first church choir. Their church was very important to them. We see Eugene and Mamie hosting a Christmas party for the children of the church where Eugene acts as Santa Claus and Mamie plays the piano. On January 3rd, 1901, Eugene and Mary have baby Mary Frances. Mary would grow up to follow in her mother's footsteps to be an accomplished pianist. In fact, 
Her talent matured beyond the skills of her local piano teacher, and at the young age of 14, the family decided that she should go to Boston in order to take more advanced lessons. She traveled at first with her mother accompanying her, and then alone by train to Boston two to three times per week for a number of years for these lessons. As a matter of fact, at this age, she also began playing the piano to accompany the silent movie pictures that were shown at the time by Mr. William Windsor in the upper floor of the town hall. From her teens and well into her later years, Mary was well known as a piano teacher on Cape Cod. In fact, those who remember her know that her music remained a constant in her life. At the time of Mary's birth in 1901, Eugene decided to run for the office of selectman. He was elected selectman and remained in this position for the next nine years. Then he chose to run for this office in 1926. And again, the townspeople saw fit to elect him as their selectman. A problem that plagued Sandwich as well as Cape Cod in general for generations was protection of persons and properties when fires broke out. Certainly Sandwich had some fire equipment and townspeople always responded to help battle fires. We see many news reports of the day of the community rallying to help one another in putting out fires. In the October 1912 edition of the Bonstable Patriot, it was noted, we have excellent firefighters in Sandwich, but no organization, and this seriously hinders effective work with no one who has the right to direct. However, in 1912, there was an apparent recognition that an organized fire protection system was needed in Sandwich. A committee was appointed consisting of John Dalton, James McCann, Philip Gavoni, Thomas Kelliker, and Eugene Haynes. They were charged with coming together to plan and organize a fire department, a weighty undertaking. I'm assuming that the complete destruction of the Boyden building on Main Street the following year in 1913 must certainly have solidified the committee's efforts. Eugene was a long-term member of the DeWitt Clinton Lodge of Masons in Sandwich, one of the oldest in the state. He held various offices in this organization. In 1893, he was installed as Worshipful Master and in 1898 as Secretary. Here we see him installed as Marshal for the year 1915. He was also a member of the East Sandwich Grange. Here we see him being conferred the first and third degrees of the Grange membership along with his wife Mamie and daughter Mary. You'll also note, among others being bestowed these degrees, is a Miss Jenny Lillian Alvander of Plowdneck Road, East Sandwich. Now, please remember Miss Jenny Alvander's name, as she will play a very important part later on in Eugene's life. From news articles, census reports, and family lore, we know that Eugene was a fisherman beginning at an early age and continuing to the end of his life. Let's talk about his fishing career. As was reported in the April 30th, 1892 Yarmouth Register, he resigned his position at the N. Packwood Company as a glass cutter and formed a partnership with Captain Jess Smith to ship lobsters to the Boston market. At this time, they also purchased Tom Larkin's boathouse on Mill Creek for their headquarters. Boathouses during this time were very important because fishermen could store their gear and boats after a day's fishing and get back out quickly the next day. 
As far as can be determined, this is the same boathouse at Mill Creek from which Eugene operated his lobster and fish business continuously until his death. He also owned and operated a fishing weir, or trap as it was known back then. These were very common and could be very profitable. And he opened a fish market in 1920, 1906 also from the Keenan building located on Java Street. In fact, in a 1910 Barnstable Patriot article, it was noted that a giant horse mackerel that balanced the beam at nearly 1,000 pounds was recently caught by Gene Haynes and Jack Mahoney in their fish trap off Sandwich. Perhaps proving that old adage, too much of a good thing, in 1918, he accepted the position of manager of the Canal Fish and Freezing Company, located on the east end of the Cape Cod Canal. The plant was built by Sandwich native Tom Kelleher and was completed in 1917. At the annual town meeting held on March 6, 1893, at age 28, we find Eugene entering into his first town elected position as one of eight constables. And he is re-elected into this position for the remainder of his life. And as we shall see, there was a general feeling in town in 1927 that his position of town constable and his tenacity in upholding the law played a key role in his disappearance. He continues in his law enforcement career, becoming appointed three years later in 1896 as a deputy sheriff for the town of Sandwich by then Barnstable County Sheriff Joseph Wickham. As a member of this 1896 team of deputy sheriffs appointed throughout the Cape, he was among other notable families such as Rich from Provincetown, Linnell Wellfleet, Baxter Hyannis, Crocker Barnstable, Nye East Falmouth. And while we may think that this was a slower, more benevolent society than we have now, no, in fact, there was no shortage of crime to attend to. Sheriff Haynes and his counterparts on the Cape were involved in investigating and solving crimes, running the gamut from pickpocketing and jumping bail to bootlegging and murder. On a Sunday in the fall of 1896, the Yarmouth Register reports that Officer Haynes, in command of a number of other officers, raided a farm in Borndale and seized a large quantity of illegal liquor. The liquor was taken down to the Sandwich Town lockup. But when the lockup was opened on Monday morning, a surprising discovery was made. The floor planking had been torn up and the liquor had vanished. The light-hearted ending to the article stated, This is the first escape from this lockup yet recorded, and it is thought that the evil spirits have accomplices in the persons of some thirsty fellows who are now in clover. In Russell Lovell's book, Sandwich, a Cape Cod Town, he tells us that the Sandwich lockup was a small, two-room building on River Street near the mill stream. With shingle sides, it looked like a shed, but the walls were made of solid, square beams, spiked together so that it was a little fortress for overnight detention. What my comment is, apparently, no one thought about reinforcing the floor. And two years later, in 1898, 
33-year-old deputy sheriff, Eugene Haynes, is in a very different situation, where he's assisting state detective Simeon Letney in a murder investigation. Simeon, or Sim, as he was usually called, was a highly regarded state detective who was stationed in Hyannis. This was a very grisly death of a sandwich native, Thomas Powers, who was found burned to death in a Java street stable owned by James Keenan, another sandwich native. Through the investigation of Letney and Haynes, it was found that three men had been with Mr. Powers the night before. A grand jury was impaneled, however, the evidence was mostly circumstantial and no one was ever charged with the murder. One can only imagine the impact this had not only on the townspeople but on Eugene as well, because of course he had to have known Mr. Powers and probably the three men who were apparently the last to see Mr. Powers alive. Records show that State Detective Letney was involved in many arrests and investigations in Sandwich, and as such, Sheriff Haynes would have worked with him on these cases. Now, I believe this would have had a significant influence on Eugene in seeing firsthand Letney's tenacious approach to his job and the responsibilities it held. In fact, an 1895 Sandwich Observer news article states, District Police Officer Letney made several successful liquor raids down Cape last week. Officer Letney is a terror to lawbreakers. And in a 1904 obituary of Letney's, it is stated in part, he is one of the most energetic and tireless detectives on the state force. While his own district, which included all Barnstable County, kept him decidedly busy, he was frequently called upon to take up other important matters. The obituary further states that among other high-profile murder cases that he handled was one of Jane Topin of Boston, who poisoned several people while employed as a nurse. As we go further into Eugene's life in law enforcement, I think you'll see that he and Letney were very similar in their dedication to their work. Both were dogged in their pursuit of the bad guys. In 1897, the records show that the very popular county sheriff, Joseph Whitcomb, died and it was necessary that the sitting governor, Roger Walcott, appoint someone to fill Whitcomb's position. Although Governor Walcott ultimately appointed Alfred Crocker of Barnstable, Eugene Haynes was among the candidates for this prominent Cape position. And though he was not appointed as county sheriff, it is quite a testament to his abilities to be in consideration for this position. And it comes as no surprise to us that we find from numerous newspaper articles that our Eugene Haynes had a hand in saving the lives of a number of people throughout his lifetime. On December 27, 1892, Mr. Edward N. Hunt, whose family lived in Sandwich, was skating home from his work at the Armstrong Union Braiding Mill, located on what we now call Upper Sean Pond. At this time in Sandwich, the townspeople called it Mill Pond. 
The account states that it was a very dark night and he skated into a large hole in the ice which had not frozen over. So we have a scene of Mr. Hunt in the freezing water of Mill Pond late at night and we don't know but probably screaming for help. And who comes to his rescue? Eugene Haynes. There are no details about the rescue itself, so we can only surmise that Eugene perhaps was skating on the pond himself and heard Hunt's cries for help. Help me, help me. Over here, help, help me. Or since Eugene was a constable, perhaps he was doing a nightly check around town. In any case, according to the news account, after considerable trouble and narrowly escaping drowning, Eugene was able to pull Hunt from the hole in the ice and carried him to the house of Mr. E.T. Pope, who lived on Grove Street. Besides being a lawyer, Ezra Toby Pope was a farmer, the doorkeeper at the State House, and he harvested and stored from Mill Pond ice for sale. Did Hunt fall into one of Mr. Pope's ice holes that hadn't frozen over? That we don't know for sure, but records show a year later that Hunt gave his notice at the braiding mill and moved from Sandwich to Middleborough to work in his cousin's furniture and upholstery business. In another account of rescue in 1898, one of the Gloucester fishing schooners, Siegfried Schooner, got in trouble during a treacherous gale and eventually went ashore on Sagamore Beach. Officer Haynes rushed to assist the other rescuers, as the Sandwich Observer news account reads, and with considerable difficulty, the rescuers eventually saved all the crew members. I find the next rescue by Eugene Haynes and his friend Jack Mahoney particularly daring. The Bonstable Patriot records this on March 23rd, 1908. The first sentence of the news article states, Sunday was an exciting day in Sandwich. The story continues that two men, Charles Colby and Joseph Bach, employed by the Sandwich Glass Factory, decided to take out a small rowboat for a leisurely day rowing off the beach. However, there was a strong southwest wind that day and they were quickly carried out into the bay. Thankfully, Charles Colby's son Carl became aware that they were in trouble and he ran to get help. Hearing of the situation, Eugene Haynes hopped on his bicycle and raced to his powerboat in Mill Creek. His friend Jack Mahoney, who also had a boathouse on Mill Creek, joined him, and they set out on their swift way to find the missing men. Two miles out, they found no trace of the small boat. They continued on and on, until at a distance of nearly seven miles from shore, they found the men who had given up all hope and expecting every moment would be their last. What Eugene and Jack found when they reached the men was that the rowlock on the small boat was broken and that Colby and Bach had lost one of their oars in the ocean. So indeed, Sunday was an exciting day and no doubt a very thankful day for the Colby and Bach families. One can only imagine from these accounts that Eugene must have had a reputation in Sandwich 
and indeed Cape Cod, as a pretty fearless man in the face of danger. These selfless acts of courage and fearlessness certainly are a measure of his character, and as we'll see, may have contributed to his strange disappearance many years later. On June 15, 1926, Eugene and Mamie's daughter, Mary Frances, married sandwich native Wallace S. Morrow, known by all as Wally. It was a happy marriage ceremony for the family and friends, and a great surprise for the invited guests. Only Mary and Wally, along with their parents, knew that the birthday party invitation was actually an invitation to their wedding. It was held at the Haynes House on 117 Main Street and was performed by Reverend Marsh of the Federated Church. After returning from their wedding trip, the newlyweds made their home in Sandwich. 1926, a joyful year for the Haynes family. Their only child, Mary Frances, marries the popular Wally Morrow. Eugene is re-elected as selectman and Mamie and Eugene continue to be involved in their community and church. But 1927 would turn out to be a tragic year for the Haynes family and indeed the sandwich community in general. So, where do we stand as far as Haynes' disappearance? Let's go back to the facts as we know them at this point. So what do we know for sure? Well, we've established that we have a 62-year-old man who spent his whole life in Sandwich, who from an early age was instilled with a strong character and a, and a desire to serve and indeed protect his community who left his home early morning on November 19, 1927, it was a Saturday, to pull his lobster traps as he had many, many times before over his 40 plus years as a fisherman. So let's start there. What could be the explanation for his disappearance? And as report, was reported in newspapers of the day, townspeople stated that they felt certain, almost from the start, that his disappearance was not a disappearance at all, but a foreboding of his death. The news articles of the day will draw us into what was described by the Chatham Monitor in 1928 as one of the most baffling cases ever known on Cape Cod. And let's remember, Sandwich was a small, small town in 1927. It was a village where everyone knew everyone. And as Jean Haynes was described in the 1927 Sandwich Independent, he was a lifelong resident of Sandwich and one of the most popular men of the town. So we can certainly conclude that this disappearance was hugely significant to the townspeople. We'll follow the developments of his disappearance as reported in news stories, and we'll also disclose the theories that evolved throughout the search for him. These theories, as you can imagine, were plentiful among the townspeople and were widely reported in the newspapers of the day. The November 23rd Sandwich Independent declares, profound mystery surrounds the disappearance of Eugene W. Haynes, and reports when he failed to return for the meeting of the selectmen on November 19th, and he did not arrive home for his noon dinner, the family were alarmed and immediately called the Coast Guard. Search was instituted without delay that Saturday. The area where his lobster traps were placed was a well-known fact, and news reports show that there was no time lost as boats were soon cruising the bay searching for him. 
Starting on Saturday the 19th, the beach shores were patrolled night and day by townspeople. Flashes were set on the shore of the beach in hopes that if he were in some trouble, Eugene would be guided home by them. The Coast Guard played a huge role in the search. Coast Guard stations as far away as Gloucester were notified and put out to sea to assist in the search. On the following Monday, they sent one of their seaplanes down and a professional diver from East Boston was sent to work and made a dive about a mile off Sandwich Beach, but could only see a short distance into the water due to the weather. As of Monday, neither Mr. Haynes nor his boat had been found. With all this effort for the past three days, there were no sightings of Mr. Haynes and nothing had come ashore. The theory of many townspeople at this point was that Mr. Haynes's boat had become disabled and drifted, that he was alive and was picked up by a fishing boat and we be, would be heard from when the fishing boat returned to port. The news article ends by stating that Mrs. Eugene Haynes and daughter, Mrs. Wallace Morrow, cling to this belief. News accounts tell us that 48-year-old Deputy Sheriff William A. Windsor headed up the local aspects of the investigation right from the start of Mr. Haynes' disappearance. Mr. Windsor was a well-known sandwich citizen. He and his wife Maud lived on 20 Java Street, and we of course can assume knew Eugene Haynes and his family well. He held a very impressive resume and it would appear was well equipped to handle this investigation. He had been appointed deputy sheriff in 1927. He had been a Sandwich police officer prior to this for 17 years. He had also served in the U.S. Navy during the Spanish-American War, and after that had spent two years each as a U.S. Naval Intelligence Officer and then as a special agent in the U.S. Department of Justice. In terms of his life in Sandwich, he was a businessman owning a garage on Main Street, the town's wire inspector, and he operated motion picture houses in Sagamore, Osterville, and as previously mentioned, in the upper floor of our town hall. Haynes is still missing, and the Bonstable Patriot reports a great gloom is cast over the whole town. As we can well imagine, the report continues, the suspense for Mrs. Haynes and Mr. and Mrs. Wallace Morrow is especially terrible. Everyone is hoping that some large boat may have picked Mr. Haynes up and continued on to its port. On November 26th, the New Bedford Evening Times reports that the town is still doggedly searching for Mr. Haynes. 100 men from Sandwich, joined by Mr. Haynes's daughter, Mary Haynes Morrow, and his brother, Frank Haynes, continue to comb the beaches between Sandwich to Provincetown looking at this point for any sign of wreckage for Mr. Haynes's power dory. The strange thing that townspeople cannot figure out is that Mr. Haynes's boat was well outfitted with several life preservers, oars, and equipment which would float in the bay, and yet no trace has been found of any of them on land or sea. This compounds the mystery for them as usually these types of objects at some point will tend to wash ashore with our prevailing winter northeast winds. Now a boy came forward who was out the morning of Saturday 19th hunting muskrats. He said that he saw Mr. Haynes cranking his engine in Mill Creek and saw the boat go off down the creek headed for the bay. When questioned, he said that he did not hear Mr. Haynes' engine stop. Nevertheless, Mill Creek was thoroughly dragged 
and nothing was found. Theories expressed by townspeople in news reports at this point remain that Haynes was drowned or maybe aboard a fishing vessel. Although we find a new twist reported as a theory of his disappearance at this point. For the first time, townspeople are quoted in this news report as saying that he may be a prisoner aboard a rum runner, which he may have happened to meet early that morning. Really? On the same day, November 26th, the Yarmouth Register printed an article titled, Search in Vain for Selectman Haynes. The article emphasizes that Mr. Haynes was a fisherman nearly his entire life, and as such was perfectly familiar with motorboats and thoroughly acquainted with the waters and tides of the bay. The theory advanced in this report was that Mr. Haynes's boat became somehow disabled and not able to make repairs, he drifted out into the bay. However, the register further points out that Coast Guard destroyers have been routinely patrolling the bay on a daily basis on the lookout for rum runners. Because of this, local fishermen believed that had Mr. Haynes' boat drifted out to sea, that these Coast Guard vessels would surely have spotted Mr. Haynes' boat. Some of the searchers reportedly believed that the boat had sunk and unable to swim in the cold water, Mr. Haynes drowned. Prayers were offered for his safe return in the churches of the town. This news article on November 29th from the New Bedford Times tells of a strong northeast wind for the prior two days, which held out an expectation for many that some trace of Haynes's dory would wash ashore if it had been wrecked, or perhaps other articles like his life preservers or oars would finally be found on the beach. But that was not to be. It also reports that a body was found off Hull the day before. Really, one can only imagine how that news resounded around Sandwich. As breaths were held and prayers were said, an investigation resulted in the eventual disclosure that the body was not Mr. Haynes. The past news reports we've talked about have been focusing on Mr. Haynes's mysterious disappearance, the search for him and the theories townspeople had of his disappearance. But this news article, with Eugene missing 11 days, gives us pause and challenges us to acknowledge the tragic human side of how awful this must have been for his wife, Mamie, and daughter, Mary Haynes Morrow, and of course other family members. The anxiety and not knowing his whereabouts and still trying to hold out hope that he would be found as every day passed with no trace of him must have been unbearable. The Sandwich Independent states that Mr. Haynes is still missing. However, the first possible clue came to light when the Coast Guard, who was still assisting in the search, pulled up from the bottom of the bay with a flounder dragger, a wire basket. Friends who were shown the basket believed that it belonged to Haynes. The beaches from Monument Point to Provincetown are still being combed by volunteers. Several pieces of wood have come ashore but none of them could be identified as being connected to Haynes's power dory. The headlines of the December 6, 1927 New Bedford Times reads, Rum Runners May Have Slain Sandwich Man. Although talk of rum runners having played some part in Eugene Haynes's disappearance had been reported in previous articles we've discussed, 
Why this theory has come to the fore at this point, we can only speculate. Perhaps one reason is because of the lack of any trace of Mr. Haynes, his dory, or any of the equipment he had stored on board. Where was he? It must have truly mystified everyone. It just didn't make sense. And there must have been a certain sense of frustration amongst the townspeople with all the effort put forth over many days that they had not been able to bring their friend Eugene home to his family. In any case, this narrative states that now the general feeling in town is that belief grows hourly that Eugene Haynes was not the victim of an accident, but was either murdered or kidnapped by the rum runners that he was threatening to expose. The theory reported in this article is that he was killed and then sunk with some sort of weight on him to prevent him from floating. Fanciful wanderings? Or could the theory be strengthened when objectively considered that could lend some credence to the speculation that he was killed by rum runners? Well, given the history of prohibition and rum running during this time period in our history, we might benefit by looking a little deeper Within this particular news article, facts are stated by townspeople and are quoted by the reporter. Facts the townspeople knew to be true from knowing well Eugene Haynes, his family, the life he led, and the lives that they together shared in this small town. He had many loyal friends in Sandwich looked at objectively, could the facts townspeople shared with this reporter in this news story hold up as motivation in considering the theory that rum runners had some part in Eugene's disappearance? Well, let's take a look at what the townspeople knew and were quoted as saying in this December 6th news article. The townspeople knew he was a sandwich constable and was bitter in his denunciation of the liquor trade. They knew he was an ardent foe of the liquor smuggling ring he believed was operating in and around Sandwich. He told his neighbors several times of finding evidence of the landing of liquor cargoes at his fish house on Mill Creek. Tracks of big trucks, imprints of many feet, and signs that boats had docked there. The townspeople knew just before his disappearance, he was seeking more evidence to prove his theory that rum was being landed from his fish house, from boats sailing up Mill Creek landing their rum in the dead of night and with a fleet of trucks taking the contraband inland in the early morning hours. There were stories about the town of a person in town who had been saying to them, If Gene Haynes had let the rum runners alone, he'd be walking the streets now. Had the example set many years before by Haynes's mentor, state detective Sim Letney, of doggedly pursuing the bad guys, sealed Haynes's fate? Two months earlier, a body had been found off Knobska Beach in Wareham by scallopers. Attempts were made by investigators to identify the person with no success. With the evidence they did have, though, 
The police theory was that rum runners had slain this Wareham man with a blow to the head and tied his body in an old piece of canvas and had weighted it down with chains so that it would sink. Townspeople fear that Mr. Haynes may have been the victim of a similar attack. However, the next day on December 7th, in the Sandwich Independent, Deputy Sheriff Windsor was quoted as saying that there was no tangible evidence shown to warrant a conclusion that Haynes was kidnapped or met with foul play. He stated that taking into consideration the milder weather conditions on that Saturday and the fact that Mr. Haynes was too familiar with the waters of the bay and his motorboat, that he would have reached his nets and returned home. Because he didn't return home, Mr. Windsor stated that he believed Mr. Haynes must have met with some physical disability before his boat got out in the bay. And yet, early on, we'll recall that the Coast Guard had dragged Mill Creek and found nothing. But in any case, Mr. Windsor continued that there were no rum runners in the bay on Saturday, which would disprove the theory that they may have picked him up. Deputy Sheriff Windsor's beliefs may have served to quell the anxiety of some or perhaps persuade others, those that were convinced that rum runners had played a part in his disappearance. But there's no denying that rum running flourished across the country, including on our own Cape Cod in this period of our history. And as I searched newspaper articles and published sources, I found that back in the 1920s, there was this notion that persists among some even today of this romanticized image of rum runners, this Robin Hood-esque, daring, swashbuckling image. But let me tell you from my research, there was nothing, nothing romantic about rum runners and the illegal liquor business. Our coastline provided an ideal route for ferrying in liquor from large vessels that sat beyond U.S. waters in Massachusetts Bay, and then smaller boats, the rum runners, would pick up the contraband and bring it to shore and offload it to the bootleggers who would be waiting in trucks to carry and distribute the liquor. It was an extremely lucrative, illegal business that flourished across the country and made many people rich, very rich. These people wanted to keep, obviously, the status quo and weren't above using violence to keep it so. Of course, local, county, and state law officials, as well as the Coast Guard, fought back against this illegal industry, but often were undermanned, outgunned, and outrun by vessels, many of which were outfitted with huge engines, and some were even jury-rigged with World War I airplane engines. And an article in the 1925 Providence Journal spoke about a growing concern of the Coast Guard that rum runners were protecting their boats from the Coast Guard gunfire by attaching steel armor plating to their hulls. Could these rum running activities on Mill Creek have played a part in his disappearance? How could that be? Well, <laughs> at first the thought seemed implausible to me. But now, you know, I'm not so sure. Research shows that Cape Cod, and indeed Sandwich, was not immune to the illegal smuggling of liquor during Prohibition 
in the years 1920 to 1933, and, of course, the violence that too often stemmed from it. Indeed, town archivist Russell Lovell interviewed seafaring mariner, uh, a gentleman named Warner Eldridge, in uh, October of 1982. Mr. Eldridge, a native Cape Codder, was born in 1900 and he died in 1991 and spent a good part of his life living in Buzzards Bay when he wasn't out shipping out to sea. In his conversation with Mr. Lovell, he's quoted as saying that the coastline from Sandwich Breakwater up to Ellisville was freely used from 1920 to 1932 by rim runners. The Chatham Monitor in November 1921 reported that Coast Guardsman Thomas Stanley, stationed at the Gurnet Station in Plymouth, was viciously assaulted on Gurnet Beach by three men believed to be rum runners on the early evening of November 18th. They knocked him unconscious and tossed him into the sea. Thankfully, the cold water brought him to and he crawled to a gunning stand where there was a telephone. Captain John Glenn, in command of the Gurnet Station, received the call and raced to the gunning stand. Mr. Stanley was at home in Situate four days later, still recovering from the effects of the assault. The Sandwich Independent of May 16, 1922 is headlined, Trawler Escapes. The Coast Guard had been seeking this steam trawler for some time, suspecting that it was involved in liquor traffic up and down the New England coast. Finally sighting it passing through the Cape Cod Canal, the Coast Guard captain commanded that it stop. The grebe kept going, not heeding the command. Captain Sullivan chased the trawler seven miles, firing 27 shots from his revolver during the chase, but the trawler escaped. In July and August of 1923, the New Bedford Standard newspaper printed each chapter of what was then the recently published book titled Prohibition In and Out, written by Roy M. Haynes, who was the U.S. Commissioner of Prohibition. On page 122 of his book, he writes, two assassins were in a position to kill an official of the enforcement force, but for some reason refrained from doing so. They wrote him later that they had spared his life because they admired his gameness in coming to a territory after they had warned him upon penalty of death to stay away. A rum runner was captured in Sandwich in November of 1924. Isaac Hammond, a Coast Guardsman stationed in Sandwich, was traveling home in his car from Down Cape. As he passed a truck that bore the name of a Boston business on its side, Hammond was struck by a peculiar smell coming from the truck. He had his suspicions that the truck was carrying liquor and probably headed for Boston. And if so, he reasoned, it would have to travel through Sandwich. So, he telephoned Captain Roger Cahoon of the Sandwich Coast Guard Station to give him heads up. Cahoon spread his men out around Main Street, and when the truck arrived about two o'clock, the Coast Guard was ready for them. This was the second time in two weeks that a truck bearing the name of a Boston company was seized in Sandwich, transporting illegal liquor. The following month, in December 1924, a Coast Guard man was patrolling the beach near High Head in North Truro when he came across a gang landing liquor. The Chatham Monitor reports that he was told in pretty plain language to beat it. This he did. 
When he got back to his station, he loaded up with firearms and men and rushed back to where he'd seen the gang. But they'd left before he was able to get there. And then we have the Falmouth Enterprise in October 1928, observing that the prior week, bootleggers were involved in two brutal killings in Boston. And the newspaper continues that in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, such incidents are almost commonplace. But then it reminds its readers, and even here in Falmouth, we had our little taste of it last winter with a rain of bullets pelting into the home of a man who had aided the police in prosecution of violation of the liquor law. In May of 1931, in large headlines, the Chatham Monitor printed, Revolvers Drawn, Federal Agents Make Sensational Capture at Sagamore, Getting Men and Liquor. Two federal agents with revolvers drawn captured two alleged rum runners at Sagamore Highland Beach. The capture followed weeks of undercover watching and was assisted by sandwiched Coast Guardsmen. They seized 94 cases of liquor, two trucks, and a large touring car. And it was reported that they are still searching the area because they believed a cache of liquor was hidden in the vicinity. What to me was a really daring capture of men transporting illegal liquor was reported in the Barnstable Patriot on May 1931. The Sandwich Coast Guard Station received a call just before noon that a suspicious looking truck was seen coming from the Hammond Farm in East Sandwich. Three members of the Coast Guard stationed in Sandwich, Bernard Brady, a Sandwich native, Luther Ellis, and Manuel Cabral, headed out quickly in an eight-cylinder car towards the farm. At some point on the state highway, as Route 6A was called back then, they met the truck and a coupe coming towards them and turned around and gave them chase. The driver of the coupe, who was part of the gang, tried to block the Coast Guard men in their attempt to catch the truck. But they shot by, and Manuel Cabral, unbelievably, jumped onto the running board of the truck as it slowed to turn up a side road, and he stuck his revolver into the neck of the driver, forcing him to stop. The men were placed under arrest, and later that day, 400 more cases of liquor were found on the East Sandwich Beach. The value of the liquor in the truck and what was found later on the beach was estimated to be between $50,000 and $75,000. In today's money, that would be $1,170,000. And then we find a new, more subtle approach that rum runners may have used. In the 1928 Sandwich Town meeting, there was an article inserted to have a chief of police position created. The news article reports that the article was turned down quickly with little discussion and that townspeople felt it was an attempt to get Michael J. Murphy, who was town constable at that time, and actually had been for the previous 26 years, out of his job. Why? The news article further reports that it was well known in town that Murphy is on the worst terms with rum runners. So, what do we make of all this? Were rum runners involved in the disappearance of Haynes? Can we say for certain? No, we can't. However, as we've seen, they were active in Sandwich and up and down the Cape. But as of the December 6th New Bedford Times article with the headlines, Rum Runners May Have Slain Haynes, nothing to date had turned up or washed ashore. No dory, 
nothing that he had in the dory, and no sign of Eugene. What to think? What to do? Thanksgiving comes and goes. Eugene's 62nd birthday comes and goes. And then remarkably, on December 29, 1927, 41 days since his disappearance, pieces of his boat drift ashore. Henry Ellis of Sagamore was walking along the shore between Sandwich and Bastable and came upon several pieces of wood he thought might be part of Mr. Haynes's dory. He communicated with Sheriff Windsor to tell him what he had found. Sheriff Windsor, along with several members of the Coast Guard, immediately rushed to the area described by Mr. Ellis. Upon arrival, a search was renewed by Windsor, the Coast Guard, and members of the community. They searched along the shore for miles and found other pieces, including one entire side of Haynes's dory. And incredibly, unbelievably, the side piece still had an identification number on it. However, the bottom of the dory was missing. Mr. Alan Beal, a Sandwich resident, identified the larger side piece as belonging to Eugene Haynes's dory. Mr. Windsor boarded the Coast Guard's boat and brought the dory pieces back to the Sandwich Coast Guard station. Once back on land, Sheriff Windsor telephoned the Custom House in Boston and learned that the number found on the boat was indeed the number assigned to Mr. Haynes's boat by the Internal Revenue Department. Pieces of Eugene Haynes's boat had been found after all this time. Although, as it seems has always been the case in the mystery of Mr. Haynes's disappearance, finding pieces of his boat certainly served to answer some important questions, but it also served to open up several other questions and they all seemed to revolve around the condition of that large piece retrieved on Mr. Haynes's dory and the manner in which it was sheared off. It had been sheared off in some way that could not be explained by the seafaring men who had viewed it. The shearing bothered them. They reasoned that if the engine was too heavy and dropped through the bottom, it would not have cut the boat up as the parts indicated. And that Haynes was too familiar with the waters in the area to run upon a rock. It was also believed that if another boat had mistakenly run into him, it would account for the shearing, but certainly they would have also stopped to rescue him. At this point, with the discovery of Haynes's boat in pieces, one imagines, if not before, there now must have been final acceptance by the family and townspeople that he could not have survived. Christmas comes and goes. New Year's Day comes and goes. January 3rd, 1928, his daughter, Mary Haynes Morrow's 26th birthday comes and goes. And then on March 7th, 1928, Elma Newell, a fisherman from Yarmouth Port, discovered a body on the outer bar at Yarmouth. Mr. Newell identified authorities and the body was taken 
to Cape Cod Hospital. A body, finally. It was, of course, thought to be the body of Eugene Haynes, but it was not to be. Three days later, on March 10th, Miss Jenny Lillian Alvander, a 28-year-old member of the Alvander family living in East Sandwich, who worked at the Greenbrier Jelly Kitchen as a preserve cook, was walking along the beach. Now, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that Jenny wasn't just strolling along the beach. For townspeople, four months out, was still searching for Mr. Haynes. They hadn't forgotten him, they hadn't forsaken him, and they still searched for him. And we'll recall, this is the same Jenny Elvander, who back in April 1923, alongside Mr. Eugene Haynes, his wife Mamie, and daughter Mary, were together presented degrees into the East Sandwich Grange. The New Bedford Times stated that there had been a storm earlier that day. As Jenny approached the Scorton Harbor area, she came across a boot lying in the sand. In the boot was part of a leg. The find was reported straight away to Sheriff Windsor and was taken to the Nickerson Undertaker's room in Sagamore. The boot and leg turned out to be key evidence. Sheriff Windsor showed the boot to Mr. Ernest Karen, local shoe dealer, who lived with his family at 19 Java Street with his shoe and boot shop next door. Yes, Mr. Karen declared. He had sold the boots to Mr. Haynes. He was certain of this as he had only two pairs in his store of that particular boot. The other pair he had sold to Dr. John Vale, who had a medical practice in Sandwich at the time. Mrs. Haynes made the identification even more positive when she described the rubber stocking he wore such a stalking was found on the leg. The Chatham Monitor news article of March 15, 1928, further reports that the belief held by many now is that his dory in which he started out that bright November morning blew up with him on board. The article further states that this appears the most sensible and logical advanced by those who have studied the case. The stock notation on the death certificate dated March 10th, 1928 by Dr. Ernest F. Curry, medical examiner, states, portion of human body found on Sandwich Beach, identified as leg of Eugene W. Haynes. Curiously, Dr. Curry further adds, probable accidental drowning. Does Eugene Haynes's disappearance remain as one of the most baffling cases ever known on Cape Cod? Well, as we've seen back at the time of Eugene's disappearance, many theories were held. Did he have an accident, a medical crisis, or did he make a fatal misjudgment that caused him to fall overboard and drown? Did he head for his lobster pots and get lost out in the bay? For that matter, 
did he even get out through Mill Creek to the bay to pour his lobster pots? And in any case, would any of these speculations have resulted in his body being torn apart? Having recovered only a portion of his leg, the theory that Eugene Haynes's boat was blown up with him on board does seem logical. But did it indeed blow up or was it blown up? And what about the rum runners? Did they lay in wait for him on that Saturday morning to finally get rid of the tenacious constable who was on to their tactics of offloading their rum at Mill Creek? That likely could have provided sufficient motive. Did they do him in before he even reached his lobster pots? Or did they wait until he was out in the bay? Surely his dory was no match for their swift motorboats. Did they run him down, sink his dory and kill him? Or leave him to die in the frigid November waters? If a rum runner boat rammed into his dory at high speed, could that account for the shearing local fishermen were puzzled by? Could the shearing have occurred if Haynes' dory was rammed by the hull of a boat clad in steel iron plating? And what about the theory that his boat was blown to pieces by some method, either by accident or on purpose? Either of these theories, ramming into his dory or blowing it up, could be the reason his dory came ashore only in pieces. Would either also account for only part of his body being finally found? Unquestionably, both methods speak of trauma and violence. So, here we are at the end of our mystery story. And as I cautioned at the beginning, there is really no resounding, conclusive answer as to why or how Eugene Haynes disappeared and died. There are plenty of theories, for sure, uh, but conclusions remain for each of us to decide individually. The long, long journey for the Haynes family and the citizens of Sandwich had come to an end. The townspeople, like any close family, had taken good care of one of their own. During his lifetime, he had worked and served alongside of them. He was their dear, dear friend, and they admired and respected him. In his disappearance, they had unwaveringly searched and searched for him and finally found him. And now it was their task to honor and memorialize him. And this they did. On Monday morning, March 12th, a regularly scheduled town meeting was held with selectman Richard Lathrop and James Freeman presiding. News reports state a large turnout. A resolution was passed unanimously expressing sympathy for the death of Eugene Haynes. The resolution reads as follows. Resolved, we the citizens of Sandwich in town meeting assembled in appreciation of his long service to the town, not only as a member of the Board of Selectmen, but other affiliated departments. Hereby express our love and deepest sympathy in the death of Eugene W. Haynes, which occurred November 19, 1927. And it is hereby ordered that a copy of this resolution be sent to the family and spread upon the records of the town. On Saturday afternoon, March 17th, 
the family had funeral services in the Federated Church on Main Street. It was filled to capacity with family and friends. This was the Haynes family's church. The church that both Mamie and Eugene worshipped in and sang in the choir. The church where George Haynes had been laid to rest many years prior. The church where Eugene played Santa Claus for the little ones. In an article written in the Hyannis Patriot, it was stated that those attending came there desiring to show the love and respect they felt for their citizen, Eugene W. Haynes. And so, we've come to the end of our story, and we've come full circle. Mill Creek, where Eugene Haynes spent many hours during his lifetime, and was the end he was last seen. And yet, he has left a legacy of which his family can be well proud. Here is a picture of some of his family, his descendants, many still living in Sandwich.